gentle and of course very modern apes, I think one of life's most simple pleasures is being right about something. Especially when the person who's wrong has been doubling down on that same incorrect point for years. It's like they finally reached the conclusion that you knew they would eventually have to reach if they kept pushing this issue, and you just kind of get to sit back and go like, yeah, I told you so. Took you long enough. <laughs> it looks like finally, at long last, we have gotten through to small-time Young Earth creationism YouTuber standing for truth on the heat problem. What is the heat problem? Who is standing for truth, you might be asking? Allow me to provide some background at a breakneck speed. The Standing for Truth YouTube channel exists to espouse Young Earth creationism in the form of debates and the much less popular shorter form videos. And when I say Young Earth creationism, I mean the normal jazz, right? The Earth is 6,000 years old, Noah's Ark literally happened, and a global flood is responsible for much of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous. There is no common ancestry, etc., etc. The channel is run by a one Donnie Deals, a man in his late 30s, early 40s, who likes to propose that young earth creationism is like devastatingly true. He uses hyperbolic titles all the time about how like young earth creationism is beating evolution and conventional science to death in a one-on-one -on -one MMA fight. That'll be relevant later. And most people have run into Donnie Deals at one point or another if they cover pseudoscience or young earth creationism on YouTube. Usually the relationship starts off fine and cordial, and then Donnie will pop off on them at one point, leading the person to just kind of wash their hands of his channel altogether, and forcing Donnie to look for a new host, like the parasite that he is. I say he's parasitic because the majority of the content, at least in the past year on Donnie's channel, has relied on bringing other people onto his channel to debate. It's not like content that he curates himself and puts out there. He lazy. The bottom line is, Donnie's channel requires perceived adversaries to actually function, and he chases off people like nobody's business, because no one wants to deal with his erratic behavior. So, he ends up constantly on the lookout for a new person to set up as someone who's fighting against Young Earth creationism, who he can have on his channel to debate and siphon money off of through their performance. Usually putting them up against convicted domestic abuser Kent Hovind. One foolish YouTuber, however, has continued to keep tabs on the Standing for Truth YouTube channel, as well as the ideas and hypotheses that they espouse in an effort to keep Young Earth creationism relevant and scientific. Yes, one very goofy person stands alone in an endless sea of uninterested parties to waste their time making sure that no unheard claim goes unchallenged. I'm not saying that's a good thing, right? I don't think he actually deserves the attention, both because he's kind of a jackass and because his ideas aren't novel. I'm just saying, I am keeping tabs on it. Hopefully I am an unnecessary watchdog, like a retired cop keeping tabs on the world's stupidest criminal. You're under arrest, Nimrod. But like stranger things have happened, and there might be merit in making sure that really dumb ideas don't exist out there unchallenged. Or maybe I just am trying to justify an unhealthy habit. So we have this goofy YouTube channel, Standing for Truth, run by Donnie Deals. What is the heat problem then? The heat problem is, in my opinion, one of the best arguments against young earth creationism, not because it's more robust than any of the others, but simply because it's very easy to understand and a very simple preclusion. That word preclusionary is really important because while there exist innumerable bodies of data out there that support conventional science's idea of an ancient earth and evolution being responsible for modern biodiversity, the preclusionary work that is the heat problem exists to show that young earth creationism isn't just beat out by these other ideas, it is in and of itself not possible under our current understanding of physics. It is preclusionary. So what is it? 
allow me to explain using recycled edited footage. They can be lazy. Essentially, in order to explain why all our radiometric dates show the Earth to be very old, young Earth creationists suggest that during the flood of Noah, something very radical happened in the realm of physics that caused radiometric decay, remember that law in physics from earlier, to accelerate by several orders of magnitude. This would allow them to stand by an Earth that is 6,000 years old, despite much older universal nuclear dates. There are several problems with this, but the big one is that nuclear decay releases heat. By taking the heat output today and applying it back in time, we end up with 1.68 times 10 raised 30 joules of energy for major nuclear decay chains over the past 4.5 billion years. This is equivalent to 4.01 times 10 raised 14 1 megaton hydrogen bombs. This means every cubic kilometer gets its own 402 hydrogen bombs, and every square kilometer gets its own 787,884 hydrogen bombs. Obviously, that's completely untenable, but actually, some young Earth creationists propose that they really only need to accelerate the nuclear decay during the flood for the portions of the geologic column that the flood is actually responsible for. So this would be from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, or rather through the Cretaceous, for the equivalent of like 500 million years. 500 million years worth of decay is 1.86 times 10 raised 29 joules and equivalent to 4.45 times 10 raised 13 hydrogen bombs. This is equivalent to 87,237 age bombs per square kilometer. Let's put this in perspective for a moment. To get all the oceans boiling, we need 5.6 times 10 raised 26 joules, and to vaporize them off instantly, we need 3.7 times 10 raised 27 joules. Both our 4.5 billion number of accelerated nuclear decay and our 500 million number of accelerated nuclear decay easily get us there. It's worth noting here that young Earth creationists today, thanks to the work of the Rate Team, a sort of think tank of young Earth creationists, geologists, physicists, etc., no one is disagreeing that the rocks look like a lot of decay has happened, and in fact that's why modern young Earth creationists invoke things like accelerated nuclear decay. So this radioactive decay is a problem for them, as admitted and outlined by them. The concept of radiometric dating using the basis of the radioactive decay law is kind of moot with regard to this particular argument, the argument of the heat problem, but I do want to note that radiometric dating does work. The entire energy industry of the world relies on radiometric dating through basin modeling, which is the first step for oil exploration, coal exploration, and natural gas exploration. So every time you fill up your car, you're validating radiometric dating. Again, it doesn't really matter because all parties from conventional science to young earth creationists alike agree that a lot of decay has occurred, but conventional science basically applies actualistic processes back in time, whereas young earth creationists think they only look old because decay was actually accelerated beyond the bounds of physics within Noah's flood and within the creation week. So moving on with more recycled explanations before we finally tackle this video. They can be lazy. Okay, so accelerated nuclear decay alone makes Noah's Ark impossible, but we actually have more heat to get rid of because you have to take all of the impact events like the meteor that killed all of the dinosaurs for the past 500 million years, and those have to happen during the flood too, since the flood is responsible for that whole column. So let's add up the heat generated from the top 10, let's say impact events of the past 500 million years. Using relatively conservative numbers, we get 4.47 times 10 raised 26 joules of energy, equivalent to another 99 billion hydrogen bombs. This number comes from my physics friend, Dakota. So let's talk about limestone next, because there is an absolute shit tons worth of limestone on this planet, and we need an explanation for it because it's all during that past 500 million years worth of time. Limestone is problematic in and of itself because it actually requires warm, calm, non-acidic waters to deposit, but let's just allow them the deposition and charge them for the heat that it takes for limestone to actually form. Since calcite formation releases heat, to account for today's limestone numbers, we get another 5.6 times 10 raised 27 joules, 
for approximately one trillion more hydrogen bombs. I thought this one was funny because if you had asked me what releases more heat, the top 10 asteroid impacts on the Earth or just the hardening of all the limestone for the past 500 million years, I would have gotten that question wrong. Magma hardening too creates issues. In order to account for all of the hardened magma we have today, we can go ahead and add 5.4 times 10 raised 27 joules, or another approximately 1 trillion hydrogen bombs. And finally, Baumgartner himself estimates the heat release just for subducting all the plates and moving them along the surface of the mantle from a supercontinent position to now, and the number he gives is 10 raised 28 joules. This is equivalent to approximately another 2 trillion hydrogen bombs, and it's probably an underestimate too since we know there have been 7 supercontinents, not 1 or 2. All of that put together is the heat problem, right? And put very simply, what the heat problem is, is it's what you get when you take 4.5 billion years worth of processes, or much more conservatively, 500 million years worth of processes, and cram them into a single year because all of those processes release heat, you end up with a excess amount of heat. A heat problem that collectively vaporizes the granitic crust of the Earth several times over, at minimum, and if we're looking at Walt Brown's model, we have the equivalent of 5,000 trillion 1 megaton H-bombs, or 5,000 hydrogen bombs per cubic kilometer of the Earth. So, that's the set stage. The heat problem is just owned up to by most young Earth creationist organizations. They look at it and they tend to say, yeah, we don't really know how we're going to solve that. It's probably either exotic future physics or a miracle. And my prediction for a long time has been that eventually all roads lead to a miraculous solution here. They're going to own up to it and say, you know what? The flood's already a pretty big supernatural event, so why don't we just allow for a miracle here? And I think that that's the smart move. But when I first released the heat problem video years ago, Donnie's reaction was to rebel against this idea. You see, Donnie wants the answer to be scientific. He didn't want to appeal to miracles, at first at least. And so over the course of several years, he just kept putting out video after video talking about how utterly destroyed the heat problem is, how it's a non-issue for young Earth creationists. And interestingly enough, most of these videos took different solutions that of course in and of themselves did not work, but all of them were titled something hyperbolically ridiculous, like the end game for the heat problem. Then how come there's a dozen of them, Donnie? As you can see by the title, it's Endgame for the Heat Problem. That is just his normal state of being. He does it unironically. Man's collected all the infinity stones of cringe and ascended to a level beyond pathetic. Of course, the reason there's a dozen of them is because none of them worked. And every time they didn't work, myself or one of my colleagues here on YouTube would point that out, enraging Donnie, sending him into a fit where he would then have another three to four hour midnight stream. But of course, Donnie isn't a geologist, and so he wrangled retired young earth creationist geologist David McQueen into being his flood geologist, alongside this random Australian guy, George Bond. My name is Donnie, and I am your host for this important discussion with Professor David McQueen and George Bond my award-winning flood researchers. Now, through the years, I've relentlessly poked fun at Standing for Truth in general, the whole channel, for trying to solve the heat problem, because, like, the big guys even know that it's not currently solved, and in fact may not be solvable. And I usually use this clip where David McQueen is talking about how he and George are, like, working on it. Tube, which illustrates heat coming up from the B-L-O-B, the blob. Uh, George and I uh, will continue to work all during the month of November on the mathematics of this. Because like, yeah, I bet. Anyways, all of this culminated in a recent discussion on the Modern Day Debate channel where David McQueen was put up by Donnie to debate King Crocoduck, who is a biomedical physicist who basically annihilated David McQueen in a video that you can find here. And I believe it was McQueen's poor performance in this particular discussion that triggered Donnie to revitalize his attempt at solving the heat problem, and so we got a couple videos on it. 
Today, we're covering the last of those videos. And with that, after 10 minutes, you're finally caught up. I have never once been accused of being brief or concise. So overall, I was very intrigued by this video because again, like the heat problem is not solvable and this is being posited as yet another decimation of the heat problem. But that is not what we got. What we got was vindication. We'll get there. So McQueen starts us off by introducing his dog and like, he makes some jokes. That's just what McQueen does. Professor McQueen, it looks like you have your partner in crime with you today. He has watched both Crocoduck and also Erica, and he's developed a taste for both Crocodile and Gibbon. Here you go, Stanley. <laughs> oh, there's some Crocodile for you. And then here is some Gibbon for you. Now run off and chew up the enemies of truth there. I wish I could be mad at this, but it actually did kind of make me laugh. I would pull the same joke with my own dogs because I have three of them, but unfortunately all of them are pseudoscience intolerant. I was just going to ask George firstly, uh, Professor McQueen, is your dog a young earth creationist as well? Just like Professor McQueen's bat dog, uh, George? Uh, def definitely. That's good. They, they know what's good for them. Yeah. <laughs> I want it on the record that I would love my dogs no matter what. Even if they were young earth creationists, my love is unconditional for them. I'm quite Christ-like in that way. However, I am pretty sure that one of them is a Lutheran because one time I was watching the Da Vinci Code and he absolutely lost his mind anytime anything Catholic was on the screen. Again, this is related to the King Crocoduck and Professor David McQueen debate. And also our favorite evolutionist, Gutsy Gibbon, put out a video. Flattery will get you nowhere. I want to begin by complimenting both uh, King Crocoduck and also uh, Erica for uh, the respect that they showed me. McQueen is very sweet here, but that's actually not why I showed the clip. Did you see it? <laughs> we got a Nephi sighting, baby. I'm glad to see him. I was worried. I hadn't seen Nephi in quite a long time. I had assumed he had overdosed on paper. So David McQueen goes on to say that he's excited to have another debate with King Crocoduck and that he wants to have a discussion with me. And like McQueen is welcome on my channel anytime. I would love to sit down and have a conversation about his ideas for solving the heat problem and his ideas for why he doesn't think radiometric dating works. He thinks it's a conspiracy, uh, but I'm not gonna go on Donnie's channel. I'm just not gonna do it. He talks about the Bible for a little while, pondering the question as to whether scripture talks about a heat problem. And then he notes that we're, today we're going to be talking about catastrophic plate tectonics, which is the flood model espoused by John Baumgartner. If you will kindly remember, that model has a minimum heat release of two times 10 raised 29 joules. You have seen her use one of my props on her video, this uh, paper towel roll. Tube. Which I've used in the past to illustrate some of the physics of what George and I have worked on for well over a year. She, Erica, was very critical of me and, and George that we started talking about this over a year ago and we haven't published the paper yet. Well, this is complicated stuff. That is actually not at all what I am roasting you guys for. Science, even in a young earth creationist context, takes time and I understand that. What I am roasting you for, or rather what I'm roasting Donnie for, is the fact that he knows you don't have the math yet and that he continually posts these videos titled things like heat problem demolished, heat problem decimated, heat problem tragically beaten to death by masked vigilante. The math is not done. I know this, McQueen knows it, Bond knows it, and Donnie knows it. So just quit pretending like it is and that the heat problem is not currently an issue. McQueen goes on to show a poster board and he shows another one later. And I believe the argument he's making is that secular science cannot account for Earth's composition or for its thermal gradient because that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. But that's not the case because Earth is not a closed system. So that law is not violated. Um, then he talks about mantle creep for a little while and how he doesn't suppose that mantle creep precludes catastrophic plate tectonics. And like, I never made any argument about mantle creep at all. So I'm not really sure why he's bringing that up. Then hilariously, 
King Crocoduck shows up in the comments and Donnie says this. And I just want to put this, this comment up to be fair because I do uh, appreciate King Crocoduck's approach and professionalism to this topic. So he says he wants to hear about the radiation problem. That's what he specifically brought up during the debate. And as host, I will make sure that that is, uh, that is engaged throughout the program. Bet. Then George takes over George Bond, who in this video I will probably refer to as both George and Bond. And he says that he's gonna tackle Casey's argument that showed statistics do not support the notion that there is biased reporting for radiometric dating, because that's something that McQueen has argued in the past, that the only reason all these radiometric dates seem to corroborate on a very ancient earth is because there's some kind of like conspiracy going on. He does think it's bottom up and not top down, but basically it's biased reporting. That's, that's the case McQueen is making. At least that's the argument that McQueen made in the debate. George is trying to support McQueen's ideas, and so he says this. I was watching a recent video from some European scientists uh, about publishing negative results. So it was called Honesty in Science, Why not Negative Results uh, Matter. So I'm just going to play a very short uh, video just to show you some, some of these statistics of what they're finding and uh, why it's important that they, uh, you know, scientists actually publish even the negative results which uh, King Crocoduck uh, mentioned that um, there aren't any. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Um, okay, so no, Casey's point was that there was no biased reporting. But then George decides to show a video that he feels displays the concern that many modern scientists have for a lack of negative or contradictory data being reported. And then the video says the exact opposite of that. And actually, the good thing about that uh, particular server is that it's divided on new results, confirmatory results, and contradictory results. And if you check uh, contradictory results, they are increasing. It's great. And if you check confirmatory results, which are that boring things in which we do again something that has been reported before, they also increasing. So I was in the gym when I was listening to this for the first time and I had to rewind it twice because what the scientist here is talking about is a server that allows you to filter by results. So you can specifically look at new papers that have come out that are reporting on negative or contradictory results. So the video is showing that scientists are presenting this server that is doing the thing that George is saying scientists are complaining they don't have, right? What is he thinking? Like George was just talking about how scientists are concerned that there aren't contradictory or negative results reported more, and then shows a video about a scientist saying, here's a server that lets you do that. Okay, th there you go. Um, there's some scientists who are really uh, concerned about the fact that uh, there are contradictory results that aren't being reported. And uh, we, know, we know of so many instances of discordant uh, radiometric uh, dates that aren't recorded. So I've done discordant dates to death. One, you need to know that if I date a rock that has previously been dated as like 3.45 billion years old, and then when I date it again, I get a date of like 3.43 billion years old, this is technically a discordant date, isn't it? Despite the fact that we can be fairly confident that this rock is like around 3.44 billion years old. And second, George, how about you show me exactly one single discordant date report that isn't chalk upable to methodological errors? Because in my many years of doing this channel, I've probably seen and combed through at least 50 young earth creationist reports of discordant dates, and I have yet to find a single one that didn't have a serious methodological error in it. I mean, uh, King Crocoduck presented, um, what was it, that funnel or, um, I'm not sure of the term he used. And bullshit and plays the I thing. I just can't, I need a drink <laughs> and a Xanax. He doesn't know what Casey did. He's arguing with something that Casey never said. He genuinely thinks that Casey's statistical work was like meant to corroborate radiometric dates. The funnel plot was on biased reporting. Then George says that he wants to see the data that KC used, which like, dude, it was in huge letters on every slide that concerned this topic in the discussion. This suggests to me that George did not actually watch the discussion in full because Casey also says it out loud multiple times. It's from Dalrymple and Bouvier. Radiometric dating consists of a plurality of techniques across many different radioisotopes, all with unique parent-daughter ratios and decay rates. 
published results consistently converge on the same conclusions using different methods over and over and over again. Uh, for example, the geologist uh, Gary Dalrymple made the table on the left, summarizing the results from research he led in 1993. Now, are you saying that the data you've plotted there is from Dalrymple's data? Yes, this, is, this comes from the table on the left. Okay. So, here's my second challenge to creationists. If radiometric dating is unreliable, then why do scientific publications consistently report the same results across different techniques, labs, and even decades? Here's a table published by Bouvier et al. Um, 15 years after Dalrymple's Chondrite publication. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. Next, he wants to show us an example of a mineral that has, like, all uranium and no lead in hopes of showing us proof that the Earth actually isn't ancient, I guess. Yeah, so there, there is no need to turn over a rock to a scientist who may intend to deceive you uh, to have it dated. Instead, you, uh, you be the scientist where the work of uh, chemical analysis has already been done. Oh, okay. Don't trust scientists that are radiometrically dating rock because they might deceive you. But do trust chemical geologists, because these guys definitely won't deceive you, that is. Why? Uh, well, duh, they don't typically produce data that shatters your worldview. But how about that Abernathyite? So if we look at uh, the Abernathyite that I mentioned, you'll see it contains 45.77% uranium, but no appreciable quantity of lead. Why is this? This is the result, 4,577 parts per 10,000 uranium and less than 0.5 parts per 10,000 of lead. So if the Earth were 4.6 billion years old, then it should now contain slightly more lead than uranium. However, as I've underlined there, if the Earth is only about 6,000 years old, <coughs> then only trace amounts of lead from decay would be found with the mineral. Okay, so like... How exactly does this help you with the fact that we have innumerable samples that do have appreciable amounts of lead, right? So most uranium is natural and Abernathyite is rare, and most of that natural uranium does have considerable amounts of lead in it. In a conventional time scale, you can actually have new rock form. This is just a part of actualism. We see new rocks forming today, therefore new rocks can form at any given point in time. So this is just allowed. However, in a younger time scale, you can't have any rocks that are older than 6,000 years. That is the absolute maximum. So while conventional science can accommodate both like trace amounts of uranium in small amounts versus larger amounts of uranium, given new rock can form and old rock persists, young earth creationism cannot. Of course, the old earth is uh, get a lot of this, may conveniently claim that the 211 uranium-bearing minerals, which contain no appreciable quantity of lead, are extremely young, while the 38 minerals, which do contain uh, lead, are old, but only eight of those contain more lead than uranium. Now, this, this, is, this is a classic uh, example of a uh, rescue device. So for those of you who may not know, a rescuing device is any time that conventional science proves young earth creationism wrong. Now, George has to actually bust the explanation for why new uranium can form. If he thinks that it cannot, he has to actually address the counterpoint itself. So then George moves on to talking about leaching. They may also claim that lead leached out of the minerals, but that claim is not valid. And here's why. If the lead can leach out of these minerals, then it can leach from their sample rock, making determining a proper ratio of dating methods impossible. So I've said this so many times with regard to geology, at least conceptually, if we can actually determine that leaching has occurred, then leaching has diagnosable characteristics. This means we can recognize those characteristics and then only date rock where leaching has not occurred. Then George goes on to talk about zircons and then he kind of says that he's going to touch more on it later and let McQueen take sort of the lion's share of that issue, but they never touch on it again. Then George says that he's going to talk about whether or not radiometric dating is reliable, to which he says, And I've said not. Oh, okay. Bond then has a clip for us, and since the last one went so well, I am very excited. I've spoken to Ian Juby just this morning, probably about, oh, about an hour ago. Oh, Ian Juby. Well, interesting. 
Ian Juby has exactly zero credentials and spouts some of the most baseline nonsense that is available to young Earth creationists. He also has connections with Kent Hovind, which I really think should be speaking for itself. He regularly brings out the Paluxy River dinosaur tracks arguments too, which like answers in Genesis lists is an argument that you should not use. And in this clip, the clip that George shows us, Ian Juby is like shambling around outside wearing a pot on his head like a crazed lunatic. He argues that lava flows are dated by several methods to be 1.3-ish billion years old, but that we find Indian artifacts in them, so they must be like 800 years old. If I drop my cell phone at Pompeii, do you actually think it would be reasonable for a future alien civilization to say the site is dated to 2022? No, actually. Nor would it be reasonable to radiometrically date the stones that make up a Roman house in order to date the age of the house. Radiometric dating tells you when the rock was formed. Juby also tries to roast Kevin Hankey, a geologist who has been on this channel before, by going on an interesting screed. Well, Hankey and the folks at the No Answers in Genesis website just couldn't contain themselves, and they wrote, oh, I love this. Considering that the half-life of potassium-40 is fairly long, 1,250 million years, the potassium-argon method cannot be used to date samples that are much younger than 6,000 years old. A few thousand years are not enough time for argon-40 to accumulate in a sample at high enough concentrations to be detected and quantified. <laughs> Did these guys stop to think before they wrote? Did they not realize that they just admitted, in print, that if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, that their radio dating methods will give a wrong, incorrect age of millions, perhaps billions of years? Did they not realize that they just handed over the entire debate on a silver platter to a guy wearing a pot on his head? I will give the pain a 10. So I don't know how many times I'm going to have to explain this. You cannot date brand new rock. This is because not enough parent has decayed into daughter material to be detectable outside of normal error bars. Once enough parent has decayed into daughter material, you get pristine calendar dates, which is why we can date the rock at Mount Vesuvius and get the age that this eruption occurred according to historical records. Then Juby says, They said there was not enough time for argon to collect. Well, actually, that wasn't the problem. That's like saying this glass of water actually only has one drop of water in it. But the amount is so small that our scientific equipment, which is insanely expensive, can't read that small an amount. That's why it shows the glass falsely as being full when in fact it only has one drop. What school did these guys go to? If your scientific equipment can't read that small an amount, it's going to read an amount of zero, not a full glass. If the potassium argon method really worked, then it should show an age of zero for the Mount St. Helens rocks. Not many, many, many millions of years old. You've got it backwards, guys. So this is actually a really interesting question with a concrete answer. The reason we get millions of years instead of zero years is that there is a minute amount of daughter present in the sample, which machines pick up on, but the error swamps the amount present. Imagine you have a scale that measures heavy objects in the millions of kilos with an error of plus or minus 50 kilos. Any sample that weighs less than 50 kilos is in the error range and becomes meaningless. But in addition, noise must be accounted for as well, and this is more difficult with small samples. Noise can result from the fact that to measure potassium, the sample is irradiated to convert it to argon, and all isotopes of argon have to be released from the mineral structure. This happens smoothly in a homogeneous mixture with a single diffusion domain, but it's much noisier in a mineral with lots of defects, e.g. multiple diffusion domains and in mixtures of tightly and loosely bound argon, some of which came from radioactive decay and some of which didn't. All of this has been known about for a long time. If this is all a rescue device, as George implies, then why is it that we know the mechanism that creates problems for overly young samples? And moreover, why is it that we get pristine dates once enough parent has decayed into daughter? We know McQueen's answer is conspiracy. It's a, it's a very closed circle. It's like a, uh, it's like a cult. It's like a, the Masonic order or the, uh, the Illuminati or something like that. But I wonder what George would put forward. Who do they think I am? Some stupid Aussie drongo? Pleading yanks. I will say though that Ian Juby is a little bit funny. He does a bit in this video where he keeps saying that secular scientists are shooting themselves in the foot and then he'll show a clip of himself pointing a real gun at his own foot. And pans off screen, but like progressively the guns keep getting bigger and bigger until he's got like a semi-automatic weapon pointed downward at his foot. It's, it's kind of surreal. 
That's shooting yourself in the foot. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Oh, they really shot themselves in the foot this time. Next, George wants to talk about footprints. This is recent. In 2005, uh, British scientists reported that they dated footprints at 40,000 years old, a direct challenge to the traditionally accepted view that humans arrived in the Americas around 11,000 years ago. Now, subsequent paleomagnetic analysis and radioactive dating of the volcanic ash by American geologists put the date at 1.3 million years old. Now, here we go here. It's not as if they, they use one method and the other team use a different method. Well, actually, that's exactly what happened. The American team dating these footprints utilized argon, argon, and magnetic pole reversals, and the British team carbon dated the overlying sediments. The American methods agreed with one another. This is also carbon dating surface sediments, which are subject to cosmogenic radiation, as we've talked about previously. This means that in the case of the British team, there will be a small amount of intrusive carbon present, which will incorrectly give a date at the older range of the method's limits. I've talked about cosmogenic radiation and contamination with regard to carbon dating to death, so you can check out my video on that. I mean, why are we getting all these different uh, answers from multiple different methods by two different independent teams? It's ridiculous. Yeah, I imagine a lot of this seems ridiculous when you don't actually like read what the methods were. And this is what Ian Juvie was talking about. Shoot, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Damn, bro, you got the whole squad laughing. Another one is the KBS Tough or, the, or Skull 1470 discovered by, by Leakey. They just kept trying and trying until they get, got something that they agreed on. Oh, hey, I know this skull. That's Homer Rudolphensis. In the case of this issue, there are several difficulties with the KBS Tuff, the main one being that it contains mixed volcanic sediments in part due to nearby erosion. Once sampling was carefully carried out with this in mind, potassium argon and argon argon dating, as well as fission tracks, all corroborated one another for a 1.8 million year ago age. Next, they take a break for questions, and McQueen does this. Okay. Yep. I was able to go to my daughter's <laughs> pots and pans, and I got one of those Ian Juby uh, pots to put on my head. A very <laughs> clever man. Oh, a clever man. The perfect descriptor for Ian Juby. I'm always saying this. Okay, so these are going to be a couple uh, criticisms for you, George. King Crocoduck has sent them in, and I want him to at least feel like he's having his arguments engaged. I think you're doing an excellent job. And so here we go. Donnie tries again to get KC's questions answered because he's still in the chat. George misunderstands a second time what KC did and what his point is, and then McQueen says this. You need to understand that I am a scientist. George is a scientist. King Crocoduck made it clear that he certainly is knowledgeable about the statistics and medical details regarding mammography as a biomedical physicist. McQueen is a scientist. George is a scientist, and KC is knowledgeable. Okay, so again, George doesn't know what Casey is actually talking about. He doesn't know what he did. And then McQueen starts talking about the heat problem, which, okay. George goes off again on the footprints and the KBS tough. And finally, Casey comments. Yes, I appreciate the responses. Excellent job, gentlemen. Uh, let me uh, present this on screen since Casey has given us his time in the live chat to engage. George, what are your thoughts on this? Let's just pretend this is a debate. I'll pretend to be Casey. I'm coming at you, George, with a rebuttal. I still feel that George has misunderstood what funnel plots entail. If there's missing data, if data was arbitrarily excluded, the funnel plot will reveal it. Well, he, he wants me to respond on something that I haven't seen. Uh, what, what data is that? He hasn't seen the plot. Cool. Where, where did you show the data? I, I don't remember. You showed, you showed a funnel, and that was it. There was no data there. I think he yeah, says it was in the uh, Dalrymple table, in, in the huh? Dalrymple data. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to debate, to debate you, mate. Um, I've shown you a number of examples where various dating methods were used, and they got wildly different dates, which, which really destroys the, the narrative that radiometric dating is reliable. I mean, that's, that's totally silly. You've got to be reasonable. This just kind of blew me away, right? Like, Bond had a whole spiel about how wrong KC was with his funnel plot, and then when pushed even a little bit on his points, he just throws his hands up and goes, nah, no, I didn't look at it. I didn't see it. I'm just so tired of finding out how little substance there is to every argument that these young Earth creationists make. But imagine how tired we are. 
Imagine how tired we are of it. So George here has cried conspiracy, right? They aren't reporting the discordant dates. And he supports this with, one, a video of a scientist who is saying that she has a server that allows you to sort by controversial or negative results things like discordant dates, which is unrelated. And then he gives a second support, which is a bunch of examples of discordant dates that have been resolved using updated methodology or problems that have been identified in the first place, which of course are, are published, right? So his initial claim that no one will publish the discordant dates and they are actually out there is like debunked by his own supporting lines of evidence. KC jumps in to say, I can also provide statistical support that no, there is not biased reporting of results, to which Bond says, sorry, haven't looked at it, after previously having talked about how dumb and silly KC is for proposing it in the first place. And McQueen throws his hands up and says, yeah, well, have you considered this other unrelated thing? Neither of them will engage with his statistical work at all. And when pushed on this, George says, I'm not here to debate, as you heard, and then says, I've already given a bunch of examples, which we've shown aren't what he thinks they are. My argument, and I hope I made it clear in the debate, King, was that this is not like some Illuminati group. It's a... It's a very closed circle. It's like a, uh, it's like a cult. It's like uh, the Masonic order or the uh, the Illuminati or something like that. That are controlling the uh, number of labs. Erica, by the way, added carbon fourteen labs into my number of labs. So the labs are not the number that Erica put. But David, radiocarbon dating is a type of radiometric dating. You're a geologist. So we have nearly 150 radiocarbon dating labs. And since radiocarbon dating is a type of radiometric dating labs, the total number of radiometric dating labs is actually significantly higher than that. McQueen remarks again on how he thinks that it's a bottom up conspiracy that these people who have corroborating radiometric dates aren't like doing an Illuminati group me where they can discuss what they're going to put down. But then like, it's a mighty big coincidence then that they just happen to corroborate one another when everyone is working independently within their own evolutionary framework. So then George doubles down on Ian Juby's question from earlier, which we of course already covered. Your dating methods then should show zero, not millions and billions of years. Daddy chill. And in all of my years as a professional geologist, professor at Virginia State University and all the things I've done, I've never actually been to a radiometric dating lab. I've never actually seen either how they do carbon-14 or, more importantly to me, how they do uh, uranium lead, potassium argon, and so forth. You know, I'm really not convinced that these guys could pass an object permanence test. Really? Like, you've never been to one, so they don't exist? They're corrupt? It's really interesting to me that McQueen takes this angle because like other young earth creationists have been to radiometric dating labs. Maybe that's why they don't argue that it's a conspiracy. They argue that there really has been a significant amount of decay as sort of supported by these rocks, these ancient ages on the rocks. They just think that the decay was accelerated. For it to be a conspiracy top down or bottom up, you either have to have like such an insane number of co-conspirators all across the world working towards the same nebulous goal, or it has to be the world's biggest coincidence. Luckily, then Donnie asks a very interesting question. How long then, therefore, do the, uh, does the evolutionary community say you have to wait before this rock can be tested? I don't well, know the I, answer, Donnie. Well, I've, I've, I've heard uh, in one case 100 years. And then uh, in the case of, I think, a New Zealand lava rock, uh, they said, no, you got to wait 200 years. So it just keeps changing. I mean, come on, right? These guys don't even know what they're arguing against, which is really not a good sign. McQueen doesn't know the answer to Donnie's question, at least he's honest, and George is just outright wrong. A hundred, maybe two hundred years. Really? How come we get pristine argon-argon dates for the Mount Vesuvius material that again matches the historical date of the eruption? This should not be if we can't get dates that are accurate from radiometric dating. Why do those dates match up with the calendar year, boys? The answer to the question is, of course, it needs to be a few thousand years. But it, of course, depends on the dating method in question. 
They answer questions from the chat for a while, cite Snelling's basalts that were improperly dated, because of course you can't date brand new lava rock, as we already discussed, and then we finally get back on top. The argument that King and also Erica have made is that if catastrophic plate tectonics is true, it generates not only a heat issue, but also would give off um, uh, radiation that would kill everybody on the ark and all the fish in the sea. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, sweet. How are we going to deal with this? I'm ready to listen. So we'll return to that next hour. The guys then decide to take a quick break, during which Donnie gives his spiel about fission tracks and radio halos and why he thinks that they are really solid evidence that accelerated nuclear decay happened, and since they anneal at a relatively low temperature, there must have been a solution that existed for the heat problem. I have covered this ad nauseum in its own dedicated video, which you can find here. George and McQueen briefly talk about granite formation, which I've also talked about in another video, which you can find here. And then Casey jumps back in to really formalize the radiation problem, reiterating the initial issues that it has for young earth creationism or that it poses for young earth creationism, as well as the fact that this is a separate issue from the heat problem. The heat problem is a different thing, which McQueen has sort of been noodling and waffling around about, but no one has thus far touched the radiation problem. So he says the radiation problem stays with or without the CPT model, and he says he'll elaborate. The creationist timeline is 800,000 roughly times as short as the scientific one. As a result, the activity of the radioisotopes must have accelerated by that factor. And he's saying this produces the radiation problem. And the annual background radiation is 0 0.62 rem per year. And he's basically um, saying that that would produce a, a dosage that is um, lethal. As in okay, everything on the earth dies, including Noah and the ark animals. And so yeah, with me, that presented, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move into part two here. King is wrong on that point. And the reason that he's wrong on that point is this. Okay, this is really interesting. Let's hear how he's wrong. I'm, I'm all ears. Reduce your expectations to zero. In the area of Hawaii, there are identifiable, using modern geophysics, blobs. Oh my god, no. This is what he uses to solve the heat problem, or at least to set the stage to try to solve the heat problem. Tube, which illustrates heat coming up from the BLOB, the blob. This is going to have absolutely nothing to do with radiation. I can pretty much guarantee it. But come on, maybe he's got a point. Maybe he's going to get to it and sort of merge the two together. Erica has uh, complimented me, I think on my use of uh, paper towel rolls like this. Two, oh, oh, which illustrates yeah! heat coming up from the BLOB, the blob. McQueen then spends several minutes talking about how mantle creep does not actually preclude catastrophic plate tectonics, again, which, to repeat myself, is not an argument that I actually ever make. So then he brings up cold slabs, which is something that George will talk about a little bit more in depth a little bit later on. So we'll kind of put a pin in it for now. Um, and finally, he says this. Now, we've been repeatedly challenged tonight by Crocoduck to tie in the heat issue to the radiation issue. And it's a point well taken. Well, you would think so, yes. But then McQueen goes on to talk about how blobs and cold slabs somehow interact with the heat problem. How any of this has anything to do with the radiation problem, I don't know. Thankfully, KC comments. I think Crocodex pointing out that he's specifically talking about ionizing radiation that um, doesn't have to do with heat. And so he was wondering your thoughts on, on the excess radiation rather than yeah. the heat itself. Do you have any thoughts on that, brother? Oh, of course. Um, um, I almost don't know where to begin. Let's try it this way. And I'll tell you... <laughs> McQueen just re-explains the heat problem uh, again and then implies that if he can fix the heat problem, this somehow also simultaneously fixes the radiation problem. Which, no, if you could somehow come up with a solution for mitigating all of that thermal energy, you still have all of the radiation, and that requires a completely separate mechanism. These two things aren't just 
you know, part and parcel, part of the, the same solution. They can't be. That's just not how physics works. And then Dolly changes the subject. So I'm, I'm saying, no, uh, there is a link between the issue of heat and the issue of uh, ionizing radiation. Georgia, pick it up from there, my friend. Gentlemen, I'd be curious as your thoughts. I just want to add this, and, and I presented this to KC in the chat. Um, I engaged in a formal debate, I think it was about two years ago now, with Erica, our favorite evolutionist, Guts a Gibbon here. Time flies. Um, and I pointed out when she brought up the heat problem that the massive amount, the miles and miles worth of water at the flood on the earth during this time could have shielded Noah and the animals from this excess heat because, or excess radiation, sorry, uh, because correct me if I'm wrong, George and Professor McQueen, don't we use water in nuclear reactors to protect and, and shield things from damage? Yeah, Jordan did the math. It's not enough. But I yeah. guess they would say that the, the, the amount of water on, uh, on the earth at the time of the flood would still not be enough. Actually, the bigger problem is the acceleration of decay, like on the ark within the physical bodies of the organisms. McQueen briefly ponders aloud how tall the floodwaters would have actually been, like in overall depth, musing that before we can really say whether a solution works or doesn't, we have to determine the actual conditions of the flood. Which like, yeah, I, I would agree. However, we don't need to figure out any of the conditions to know that accelerating the nuclear decay um, is completely untenable. It's going to vaporize the granite crust of the, of the Earth several times over, like more than two dozen times over. Uh, I'm going to try and cover this quite quickly because otherwise we'll be here for three and a half to four hours. Well, so this video is over three hours long, right? So George did not do a good job here keeping things concise, which... You know, I, I empathize with that. I have a similar problem. Um, and then he tries to knock out my explanation with regard to cold slabs. Before we hear him out, let's talk about what cold slabs are. So during tectonic activity, sometimes two plates meet and sometimes they crush together and form a mountain. And sometimes a slab is subducted underneath another slab. When this happens, eventually over long periods of time, because the slab is being subducted into the mantle below, it will reach thermal equilibrium with the surrounding material, growing hotter and hotter until it is thermally essentially indistinguishable from the mantle around it. The cold slabs are a problem proposed by young earth creationists that argues that basically the fact that we can still make out slabs means that the earth can't be very old because under evolutionary preconceptions or an ancient time scale, which those two things are, are interchangeable to young earth creationists, the slab should have reached equilibrium with the surrounding mantle by now. So let's hear George. Uh, uh, Erica presented this, uh, this paper in one of her streams as a possible, or not a possible, but a solution to the cold, cold slab <laughs> subduction. Uh, as I said uh, previously, uh, I read this paper shortly after it actually came out. And um, really, when you, when you look into it and actually read it, um, it's nothing but a model that's full of assumptions. And if, even even they admit um, admit it, and it's and it's limited to sixty to one hundred uh, kilometers, not the seven hundred kilometer to, kilometers that these subduction zones um, are detailed to um, protrude into the mantle. So George is going to take two primary issues as we move forward. The first is that he doesn't like that the paper I used to support the fact that conventional science does not have a problem with cold slabs uses words like may, variability, uncertainty, and especially not the word limitations. This really seems to trigger George and concerns me greatly because for those of you out there who read a lot of literature uh, within the scientific community at large, you know, including limitations is like a huge part of the vast majority of studies, especially if you're you know putting forward a model. Right. And what the paper that I utilized did is it modeled the sort of thermal uh, evolution of a slab as it subducts. That's it. Now, of course, the most rapidly changing portion of a slab as it subducts is the first 60 to 100 kilometers. So I don't think that they did that particular section because, you know, they, they were worried they were going to get debugged by young earth creationism. Rather, that was just the most appropriate era to model. So the issue number one that George has is the wording that this paper utilizes. And issue number two is, of course, the limiting nature of what they modeled. He thinks that the model should have included 
all 700, 800 kilometers of a subducted slab. So keep that in mind moving forward. But you'll, you'll see straight from the start, it may have dynamic origin. So they're speculating already. That is literally just the language that scientific papers use. You see what I mean? I worry that George has not read very many of them if this is sticking out. So look, I'm just going to leave it like that. And you, you, you can take screenshots and, and read it yourself, but you, you'll find that there's a lot of uncertainty. You see straight from the start, they, they talk about millions of years. And, and they'll, they'll use words like likely. So there's more uh, uh, likely and assume, more speculation and conjecture. And they then list the limitations of their approach. And I kid you not, that is this whole section of George Bond. He gets into it a little bit more later as to some of the technical issues he takes with the paper. Uh, but we don't get that until Donnie pushes him. So this is what we have. We speculate. Can I pray for you? Perfect. Dear God, I thank you for my man right here. I know that he's been making some very bad decisions and he's in a season of stupidity, but you can pull him out of this and use him a little bit. Okay, so really that paper is, is a model, a simplified model with lots of assumptions to, to get the answer that they want. And as I said, they, they talk about millions of years before they even start to uh, look at it. So George basically has a problem with it because one, it's a model, and two, it assumes millions of years, which he supposes implies nefarious intent. No, millions of years is assumed because young Earth creationists have not done the legwork to show that it shouldn't be assumed, and it continues to make accurate predictions each and every day. And then three, he has an issue because he doesn't think the model is inclusive enough. It doesn't include the entirety of the slab, just the portions that the authors felt were thermally relevant for the evolution of temperature change. George then does some back of the envelope calculations, which he supposes give a proper estimate for when the slab should have reached thermal equilibrium, uh, sort of within a conventional scientific context in the mantle. So let's reiterate the situation with cold slabs. Cold slabs are an argument utilized by young earth creationists that has to do with tectonic plates. As the tectonic plates move and meet at boundaries, they can subduct underneath one another. In this process, a plate is shoved into the mantle where it is heated and eventually reaches thermal equilibrium with the surrounding rock. The creationist argument is that there are some slabs that should have reached equilibrium by now, but haven't, and thus they haven't been subducting for millions of years, only a few thousand. No, they do not have their own model to explain the data. The explanation that the paper I used proposed for cold slabs was pretty simple indeed. It basically suggested that when we have these cold slabs, the slab that is subducting into the mantle is usually coming from being underneath an entire ocean. Thus, it is suffused with water before it is actually subducted underneath the sort of adjacent plate. And because it is suffused with water, the melting point is higher, meaning it takes longer for it to reach equilibrium with the surrounding mantle. And you know, I thought to myself, since George has brought up these questions, I really want to make sure that I'm actually getting that model right. I really want to make extra double, triple positive that I'm not misrepresenting the authors. And so I reached out to them. Did your heart just leap into your throat, George? First, I asked Dr. Holt if the cold slabs were considered a thorn in the side of modern geology, which got a hearty no. Cold slabs are not puzzling at all to modern geologists, and the purpose of the paper was not to address this problem, but simply to model slab temperature change. The author even clarified why cold slabs are not an issue in a very simple way, including the relevant geodynamic equations. First, he corrected me that when slabs reach equilibrium, they do not melt, but rather stay solid. The entire mantle is effectively solid and appears to flow only over vast amounts of time. So he explained it to me like this. Quote, in terms of the cold but solid slabs, an even simpler explanation for why they hang around is just considering their thermal properties, or more specifically, the thermal diffusivity of rock. Thermal diffusivity is a rock property we can measure. It's a combination of density, conductivity, and thermal expansivity, properly linking density changes to temperature changes. Because this diffusivity, kappa, has units of meters squared per second, or a length squared over time, and a first order value of 10 raised negative 6 meters squared per second, i.e. a millionth meter squared per second, you can write kappa is equal to x squared divided by t, where x is some length scale in measures, t is some time scale in seconds. This can be rearranged to make the time scale the subject, t is equal to x squared divided by kappa. This gives us a rough time, t, that it takes for a thermal anomaly length equaling x to conduct away. If we plug in realistic values of kappa, a first order accepted value for rock is equal to 10 raised negative 6 meters squared per second, 
and take the thickness of a typical slab, say 60 kilometers or 60,000 meters, then T is equal to 60,000 squared divided by 10 raised negative six, or approximately three times 10 raised 15 seconds, equaling 110 million years. So the cold slabs take many millions of years to thermally equilibrate with the mantle. I had absolutely no idea that the solution was this simple, and I also had no idea that cold slabs had been solved for so long. But George really wants to move on to the heat problem, so he says this. Let, let's explain the, the, this um, heat solution that we propose is a hypothesis, okay? It's a hypothesis. It's not a theory. It's not a fact. It's a hypothesis that we're investigating. Followed by? Yes, we haven't worked out all the physics, but there may be geophysics mechanisms we don't yet understand or are aware of. So then they have an idea, a hypothesis, unsupported by any current map. That's exactly what I've been saying this entire time, that that's all they have. Donnie is the one proposing that the solution already exists. We've got no problem explaining these, these, these uh, subduction plates and the hot blobs, okay? Neither does conventional science, but then George puts a timeline on the solution. Wait and see what happens with this new research and where it takes us. There, there are things there that we don't understand that we may understand Maybe not in our lifetime, um, but maybe maybe it's around the corner. Who knows? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, okay. So there might be a solution if physics gets a complete overhaul in the next several thousand years. He brings up Z-Pinch, which I've done to death in like the past three videos. But let me put it very simply. Z-Pinch is invoked by young Earth creationists to either get the heavy elements or to accelerate the nuclear decay. It doesn't matter which one they're invoking it for, because to get a Z-pinch, you need the Earth to be in a plasma state already. And that's not even taking into account the fact that the piezoelectric effect needed to trigger the Z-pinch cannot actually get large enough within the bounds of physics to create a Z-pinch that large. The mechanism doesn't exist. And then George goes on to say this about radiation, and it's very odd. King KC, uh, we don't know much about the radiation. Y you're just making a lot of assumptions that, hey, uh, the ionization is going to fry everyone to death. We, well, we don't know that. We, we just don't know that. This guy has achieved a level of loser that science didn't even think possible. We absolutely do know this with 100% certainty. This is just how physics works. Unless you have a way to mitigate it and like... I don't think you do, decay releases radiation and heat. Casey is using only known physics to make this point. George, as sort of a counterpoint, although really it's more of a rescuing device if we want to be consistent with our language, is proposing future magic physics will make it so this is not actually a problem for them. And like, that is super duper silly, like so beyond goofy and also just really, really desperate. He rambles for a little bit more uh, on Z-Pinch before saying this. But what they what they also find uh, say is after several hundred analytical studies of measure, measuring the post-experimental composition of our target samples, it became clear that the statistical mean curve of the abundance of chemical elements created in experiments are close to those characteristic in the Earth's crust. Uh, what what that's saying is they actually created super heavy elements with par with parent to daughter ratios similar to the characteristics in the Earth's crust. <laughs> Absolutely not. That is just not what they found, you ding dong. So remember, the Z-pinch requires plasma conditions to work, as in conditions found within the belly of a star. And this makes a lot of sense because what the researchers were trying to show is that you can get Earth's elements in their given concentrations through nucleosynthesis, right? Through the processes within stars. This is what conventional science has always said about the origin of the elements, much to the chagrin of young Earth creationists like George and McQueen here. This has to do with the elements themselves, where supposedly Proton-21 was able to form super heavy elements, which are only found in labs, they aren't found naturally, that rapidly decay, having a half-life within minutes, into the heavy elements that we find around the world today. The idea is that this happened in the bellies of stars billions of years ago. Their study had absolutely fuck all to do with the parent to daughter ratios of heavy elements like uranium to lead. And I combed that study looking for any reference to what George is talking about here. 
He seems to have just pulled it out of thin air. Try reading the study before you talk about it, yeah? At the end of the day, it's just another example of you being stupid. So George switches topics to talking about how the mantle could have acted as a heat sig for the heat problem during the accelerated nuclear decay of Noah's flood. Him and McQueen have been on about this for a while, utilizing the mantle for a heat sink. Now, there's a punchline here, you're gonna hear it soon. First, he argues that since the mantle is 2400 degrees Celsius today, he can just assume that it was 2000 degrees Celsius in the past, and a lot that all of that heat would then raise the mantle by 400 degrees Celsius. This is all kind of arbitrary. What he did is he took the mantle from today and worked backwards by adding heat to it from a past state to now. So he took the 2400 degrees Celsius today, did the math to remove all the heat from it, and you end up with 2000 degrees Celsius. So that's what he assumes the mantle of the past would have been like in order to sort of heat up to its present day condition and thus account for the heat problem. Um, stop, full stop, do not pass go. That means the mantle is 2000 degrees Celsius and thus the crust has to be hotter than that for heat to flow into it. This is like basic laws of thermodynamics stuff. And George recognizes this, which is why at the end he says this. Now, one thing I'll, I'll be upfront and say, we don't yet know how that heat transfer occurred. We don't have the physics at the moment. There may be new physics or new processes that can put some light into that. But at the moment, we've got some, uh, our contention is that those blobs that you that you saw earlier were actually um, uh, remnants of that, of that heat absorbed in the mantle. Yup, and that's the entire freaking problem for this dude. You don't have any math. This is exactly what the rate team did when they ran into the exact same problem decades ago. They saw the heat problem and they said, it's either gotta be exotic future physics that's the solution or it's gotta be a miracle. So congratulations, you finally caught up with the mainstream creationist talking points here. <laughs> George promises us that later in the program, he's going to introduce us to the secular heat problems. And I got really excited because I was like, oh, okay, this might be challenging. And I hate to burst your bubble, but they're not actually heat problems. He's using heat problem to mean unanswered question. And then he doesn't understand that the heat problem for young earth creationism is unanswerable at present. As for secular science, there are a lot of unanswered questions, but none have preclusionary data. I'm going to introduce you to secular heat problems that they don't address. They simply hand wave it away and they just keep going about the heat problem that creation yeah, has. have. You know, they do. You've got a heat problem. Hey, how yeah. about the multiple heat problems that you have that you can't address? Bobby, Daddy, chill. First of all, okay, I'm one of the only people on the entire planet going on about the heat problem for young earth creationism. And this is primarily because most scientists don't know that you guys still exist. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and spoil it ahead of time, right? George doesn't actually have any legitimate challenges to conventional science here. He poses a lot of unanswered questions and most of them, if not all of them, I can't remember, are actually solved. And he just doesn't know what the solution is probably because he's utilizing primarily young earth creationist sources from a decade and a half ago. Now, then McQueen notes that he has to go and he leaves us with a heartfelt goodbye. As my friendship with King Crocodile grows and Erica and the opportunity of debating them in February and March of next year, I do view it in all honesty as a growing friendship. And this is why McQueen, although very wrong, is ultimately an okay guy. So then we're left with George and Donnie for the remainder of the show, which is only marginally better than Raw Matt and Donnie, but it is better. And Donnie begins with a question. If you were to um, put the acceleration, the, the accelerated decay at mostly creation, but some at the flood, we could assume that if it was at creation, creation week was a an accelerated week anyways we've pointed out before this kind of like it's a time lapse right 
right. that you see in video form where everything is accelerated in terms of processes. There's two events in the history of the world where we would have that, where it's it's not like we would see today in, in terms of what we're observing. That'd be the creation week and obviously the flood year. Donnie is basically asking if we can limit the accelerated nuclear decay during Noah's flood to the past 500 million years, if that's going to make the heat problem any better. And it does make it better, uh, but it doesn't get it anywhere close to solved, I'll put it that way. We already saw the math for this. Here it is again. By taking the heat output today and applying it back in time, we end up with 1.68 times 10 raised 30 joules of energy for major nuclear decay chains over the past 4.5 billion years. This is equivalent to 4.01 times 10 raised 14 1 megaton hydrogen bombs. This means every cubic kilometer gets its own 402 hydrogen bombs, and every square kilometer gets its own 787,884 hydrogen bombs. 500 million years worth of decay is 1.86 times 10 raised 29 joules, and equivalent to 4.45 times 10 raised 13 hydrogen bombs. This is equivalent to 87,237 H-bombs per square kilometer. And again, that's not taking into account the heat that necessarily has to be restricted to the flood from creating all the limestone, hardening all the magma, all of the impact events, and moving the continents around at race car speeds. So yeah, still not gonna work. And then there's like the theological implications of just proposing that God made everything to look old. Isn't that a little bit deceptive? I feel like Andrew Snelling has spoken out against that, at least with regard to making light in transit. There are people in the background are currently looking into this, okay? We're not going to provide you with an answer next week or next year. We may, but I doubt it. But it may need some some uh, new physics that we haven't really looked at uh, or found that could, could explain it. If you put this into the creation week, that makes sense. It's a supernatural event anyways. Okay, so in other words, the rate of heat and radiation dissipation and removal is relative to the rate of radioisotope decay. And so creation week would consist of the acceleration of all natural processes, like a time lapse, but where you have radioisotope um, decay accelerated, you also have the super cooling with it, or the, the rapid removal of excess radiation with it, if it's happening during the creation week. Now, firstly, we'll get your- So yeah, like you can put around 4 billion years worth of decay during the creation week before any critters are on the land masses. And whatever, it's magic, it makes it not science, but if you want to do that, be my guest. You still get absolutely annihilated by 500 million years worth of decay processes and other assorted processes during the flood. And I would even argue alongside the rate team that you have to have at least 500 million years worth of decay in the rock that is in the geologic column that was supposedly created by Noah's flood, because otherwise, why is it in order? Why is it in radiometric order. It, it would basically be arguing that the flood comes in, shakes up all of the sediment on the planet, and then it just so happens to lay down according to evolutionary time scales, which I don't suspect Donnie uh, would, would sort of subscribe to, if you will. Sorry, these are questions we don't have answers to yet. This next part of the conversation is probably my favorite part of anything that Donnie's ever put out on the Standing for Truth YouTube channel. Um, because he basically just admits that, yeah, like it, it might be supernatural. Him and George finally, after all these years, admit that the solution to the heat problem is probably supernatural, which is what I've been saying they should say since I first made the heat problem video. The heat problem burns young earth creationism up into a crisp, the smoldering embers of which cry out with a depressingly genuine certainty that miracles simply must be the answer. Of course, as previously stated, this wretches creation science from its ramshackle throne of, of special pleading, poor methodology, and bogus papers, and violently suplexes it into the tar pit that is unsubstantiated claims. Damn, I was so much more poetic back then. Anyways, so here's Bond and then Donnie just saying that. Like, yeah, it might have been a miracle. Sure, whatever. Look, it, it, it may have been a supernatural event, I, I, I'll admit, I don't, I don't know, but as I said, there, there are people working behind the scenes at the moment on this issue, and I don't know if we're going to get an answer next week or next year, but there are people working on it. Although we may not know the source or the mechanism behind the supercooling, perhaps it is 
uh, supernatural. The Bible does say that God is, is Lord over the flood. Okay. I mean, come on, guys. You could have saved me so much time if you had just admitted to this two years ago. I kept showing you over and over and over again. Colleagues of the channel, like Jordan, kept showing you over and over and over again how this doesn't work without a miracle. But no, you said, every time you were going to find a way to do this with science. And now it's just a casual, yeah, sure, why not? Sure, it could have been a miracle. Flood's a miracle anyways. It's so unbearably frustrating and was a massive waste of my time. Thank you for that. So professionally educated creationists know that this is a problem that can't be solved by miracles. All of us here on the panel have said this before, but this has been not appreciated by very many of the creationists that are here online. That is that is the, the thesis statement of this stream. You're going to solve the heat problem with miracles, or you're not going to solve it. The heat problem, they'll probably eventually give up and say, okay, we have to have a miracle. But then they'll say, ah, but evolutionists have to appeal to a miracle themselves for like the Big Bang or, you know, abiogenesis or something along those lines. I feel such a mixture of emotions about this whole thing, because like, on one hand, I feel so vindicated, right, that he's finally had to come to terms with this and admit that this is an issue that cannot be solved without miracles. A prediction that I made that has come to fruition here two years later. It feels really good. And yet, on the other hand, right, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into finally conquering Donnie Deals' delusion that he can fix this with any kind of conventional means within physics or mathematics. You do need a miracle. Thank you for finally saying it. And I want to note that I couldn't have done this without friends of the channel, Jordan of Reasons to Doubt, Dakota, and many, many others. Next, Donnie Muse is about the exact number in like square or cubic kilometers that he would need in order to shield Noah and the Ark animals from all the radiation. Again, it doesn't matter. The radiation is coming from inside the boat. You know, I'd like to know how much water would be necessary on the, if the entire planet is covered by water. You know, how much of that would take up and shield Noah and the Ark animals from, from the excess heat, right? I wonder if we could get some calculations there. But like Casey comes in and really hacks him to bits on that subject. Because King Crocodile says, Donnie, we are talking about energies that can pass through all the water on Earth 50 times. So it seems like KC is claiming then that no matter how much water you truly have on the earth at that time, it still won't be enough to shield Noah and the Ark animals from the excess radiation that they are being subjected to. You know what I mean? So it'd be interesting to, to get some numbers on that and, and see if that truly is the case. However, he does bring up hypercanes. Jordan, friend of the channel of the Reasons to Doubt podcast, already did the math for the hypercanes. And Donnie kind of hand waves it, but like, let's appreciate what those numbers were again. And maybe we can also consider the hypercane model, because we do know, and I know Jordan has criticized this and put some numbers together as well. All I have to do is fill out these variables and we'll be done. First up, the amount of rainfall. According to the NOAA, that's the government agency that tracks hurricanes, your average hurricane drops one and a half centimeters of rain per day over its area. The Institute for Creation Research says that hypercanes drop 10 times more rainfall than a hurricane. So let's give our hypercanes 50 times more water than a normal hurricane. A mega hypercane, if you will. Next, the area of the storm. Now, I'm not sure what the area is. Um, estimates vary, but I can tell you what it definitely was not more than. The entire surface of the Earth. So we are going to go wall-to-wall -wall hypercanes. Finally, the duration of the storm. According to Genesis, there was heavy rain for 40 days, light rain for 150 days, then no rain for the remaining part of the year as things dried out. Now, we could say the heavy rains are hypercanes, and, but maybe the light rains are hypercanes too. I mean, light is a relative term, but let's just cut straight to the chase. We're going to go year-long hypercanes 24-7, 365. Can't get more than that. So plugging all those numbers in, we get a total heat dissipation from the hypercanes, and it is a lot of heat. Unfortunately, that heat, which is 3.15 times 10 to the 26 joules, only represents 0.02% of the heat that needs to be rejected. We still have 99.98% of the heat remaining. Despite the Earth's year-long mega hypercane bonanza, the thermometer has not budged. Let's just say my dad was crying for probably about one or probably about six hours, literally. Yeah, I'm afraid this isn't a hand wave kind of situation, Donnie, if your wall-to-wall -wall mega hypercane stronger than anything ICR has put out doesn't get rid of more than 0.02% of the heat. 
you can't just go, I know Jordan Spence in math, but you got to actually, you know, deal with that. What what makes me laugh about your theistic evolutionists like Joel Duff here? You know, no, no offense by this, but they actually claim to believe the Bible, right? So so we're showing that you can have a supernatural event. Okay, I want to see uh, Joel Duff here talk some theology, some soteriology, some eschatology. You know, these theistic evolutionists they don't have an excuse. They, they want to use the same arguments that the naturalistic atheists use and the evolutionists and agnostics. And I understand where people like King Crocodile are coming from. They want to see if there's a naturalistic explanation. Okay, and, and that's what we're doing. Here. But when it comes to your so-called theists, the Bible says that God initiated the flood. God stopped the flood. God is Lord over the flood. Second Peter three says uh, that there's three things. Donnie brings up the Fission Tracks Radio Halos thing, which again, we, we did a video on. I want to see some answers to these challenges. Um, from the critics, okay, if, if, if they still have a problem yeah. with this, this heat issue. And then Joel comes back. I'm interrupting you. I know you're going to be mad, but I just have to address this. Joel Duff says, yeah, it was I a miracle. That. Why is it so hard? To I, I've already said this for over a year. I said, the critics are rejecting yeah. the miraculous aspect of the flood. God is Lord over the flood. They are rejecting that. And then Donnie underscores this by saying, because fission tracks and radio halos wouldn't exist if there was a heat problem, there was no heat problem, so deal with that. Which, again, we did. So you can't just dis disregard the supernatural aspect of heat and radiation removal, because in order to do so, you have to address the radio halos and the fission traction. Finally, at long last, George goes off on his tirade about the secular heat problems. Let's listen. The, the formation of the inner core. Um, this is a, a, a secular paper. The time needed for the formation of the inner core blows out beyond the expected 1 billion year age to at least 10 billion years. That's even longer than the alleged 4.5 billion year age of the entire Earth. Now, that's their, their, their own calculations that have said that. Before we touch on this iron core stuff, I think now is as good a time as any to let you know that none of George's like challenges are preclusionary in the way the heat problem is. And most of them have answers. In fact, I think all of them have answers. They're just not universally accepted as like the single one answer. Usually people are quibbling about the minutia, but like, I'm sure that comes as no surprise. Let's talk about this first one. I found two more recent papers on this one, as opposed to the one George showed. One in 2019 suggests that the Earth's inner core was young during the Ediacaran just 635 million years ago on the basis of paleomagnetism. This is interesting as a later study in 2021 modeled the inner core formation while taking the asymmetry of the core into account and got a date of around half a billion years, right around the Ediacaran. Both of these papers are compatible with the idea that a metal alloy sinking into the previously liquid core allowed it to solidify, but we don't have any full agreement yet. This is an open question as far as I can tell, but not knowing the details of our inner core formation is not analogous to a miraculous flood that left no trace of itself and enough heat to vaporize the planet a dozen times over. Uh, I, I, I spoke a lot about fulgurites, uh, that's fossilized lightning. We only seem to find these fulgurites on the surface uh, layer of the Earth. We don't seem to find any in the preceding layers. I mean, if these things are millions to billions of year, years old, why aren't we finding uh, fulgurites? Some will say, oh, they eroded. Well, look at the layers. There's very little evidence of erosion that occurred uh, between those layers. Fulgurites. Okay, so first of all, that lack of erosion between the layers, he just doesn't know what bedding planes are. Neither does Nephilim Free, so I guess that's understandable since Bond and Nephilim Free are like very close to the same level. But moreover, fulgurites are not actually uncommon, fossilized lightning that is. In fact, I just went to Google Scholar and put in fulgurite paleoecology and I got like numerous different papers right off the bat. We found a lot of these things, and the very first one reported on was from the 60s. Um, so next. And of course, the, the Pete Sandstone, and um, this is a, a great example of how um, the uh, evolutionists or the secular community will do anything to prevent uh, creationists from doing research that could support our particular narrative, okay? Um, when AIG applied for a permit to, to undertake the uh, Sam take samples from the Tapete sandstone, especially in those 90 degree uh, bends, they were rejected. They had to go to court to get that permit. And anyway, finally, they, they got their permits, they did their, their tests, and under the secular scenario, those bends were created uh, deep down in the earth, probably three, four kilometers down under 
heat and pressure and lateral compression to bend them well. Sorry, but the uh, results so far show that there's no evidence of metamorphosis. There's no crystallization in those layers, which means that heat was not involved. So those layers had to be moist when they were bent and dried in the ensuing years. I'm going to press X to doubt on there not being metamorphic rock in the Tapit sandstone because I found a source for that quite easily. But moreover, the Tapit sandstone is chock full of bends and folds. We find both flexural slip and abundant fractures in the Tapit sandstone. Which, wait, now how does that happen in a global flood? So actually, my main source for this is the text Grand Canyon Monument to an Ancient Earth by an absolute metric tons worth of geologists. They've got this nice comparison here from page 126 to 127 that compares the Tapit sandstone, which is what George was just talking about and which was ostensibly not formed during a global flood, versus small scale flood deposits, right? So this, this dewatering and soft sediment deformation in the Nellie Bly formation west of Tulsa, Oklahoma, this is what we should see in Tapits if it was formed by a global flood. Note that there's no cracking in between the folds whatsoever. And yet, hmm, that's not what we find, is it? Okay, uh, I mentioned the crust of the earth with the granite. They, these are the specific uh, minerals uh, that are there in their respective uh, densities. If it cooled over uh, hundreds of millions of years, then you should expect to see those specific minerals in that particular order. Bond talks about the concentration of radioactive elements being primarily in the crust, and this is because they readily form compounds that are less dense than their individual parts in the mantle. That's what causes them to kind of sift out into the crust of the planet. I, that's a bad explanation, but I explained it much more in depth in another video, and I can't really be bothered to look it up since this is my fourth video on like flood models, the heat problem, radioactive decay, and these MOOCs. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. I'm a little jet lag, more than a little jet lagged. I haven't eaten in probably two days. I'm just trying to sort of push through, do my work, be very happy. I'm sure tomorrow we'll, I'll wake up and go, oh, okay, now I'm gonna do this. He also talks about the formation of granite, which I've also talked about in another video. So this, this is from uh, Japanese spacecrafts, okay? They, they say this amount of carbon, oh, by the way, the carbon is a volatile, uh, uh, is volatile and so is water, and um, they find these gases and, um, on, the, on the moon, and it says this amount of carbon should have been utterly vaporized by the intense temperatures generated in the colossal impact event. But the findings suggest carbon has been there ever since the uh, moon's formation 4.5 billion years ago meaning the impact theory may need to be considered. Now, those aren't my words. They, they, those are from, from the paper, from the Japanese paper. Looked into this one because I'd not heard about it. And yes, it, it's super interesting. It seems as if they're trying to rethink aspects of the impact theory, not considering throwing it all out entirely, though, which begs the question, why did George present it that way? Okay, water comets, you know, the, the secular explanation, water actually arrived on Earth through um, comet, comet uh, impacts. When you look at the the volume of water and the volume of um, of a comet and equated to uh, energy and number of uh, impacts, uh, you get something like this. You, you get you get um, 4.2 by 10 to the 24th joules per year. Uh, now, if you if you equate that to say Hiroshima bombs, that's 6.7 by 10 to the 10th power Hiroshima bombs per year for 500 million years. Yes, impact events release an absolute ton of heat. This is massively problematic when you have one year of Noah's flood, but not so much when you have 500 million years during the very early history of Earth when the planet was sterile. There was no life on the planet at that time. And in fact, it's not the only time that we got bombarded with lots of different meteors and comets and things like that. The late heavy bombardment period would come after that and pepper the Earth with even more craters. But to put it in a little bit of perspective, that number that you just presented is lower than the higher end estimate for the energy released by the top 10 impact events, all of which have to happen within the year of the flood. The horizontal problem. Uh, why is the uh, CMB so even across the universe? The horizon problem is solved by cosmic inflation, like one of the really basic principles behind what the Big Bang is and how it operated and how it continues to operate. The Earth's magnetic field. Uh, now this is from ICR, but I've, I've read articles from uh, Secular as well. Like in uh, the Earth's magnetic field, for example, decays with a, as, at an exponential decay of 1,400 years as, a, as its half-life. 
Now, if, if you if you if you actually go back, say six thousand years, that's twenty times stronger. But if you go fifty thousand years ago, the magnetic field would would have been fifty six billion times stronger. That's about equivalent to a neutron star. Every everything would have been cooked and vaporized uh, in that. Uh, they won't address those, right? They won't address those. So, like this one really kills me, and that source has to be a million years old because this is a really stupid argument that most young Earth creationists don't tend to use anymore for a very simple reason. One, the magnetic field doesn't decay exponentially in one direction, right? It flips. Magnetic field reversals are seen all throughout Earth's history. You can clock this by looking at things like iron banding, if memory serves. I'll put a picture here so you can see what I mean. But moreover, young Earth creationists invoke magnetic field reversals themselves. They just think it happened rapidly over and over again during the year of the flood. It's like you're arguing with your own guys here. So uh, hopefully I've presented enough, enough, um, I guess, bullets. I've fired enough bullets at them to say, okay, explain, explain yourselves with those particular heat problems of your own. They won't do it. I've never seen anyone address, address those. Then you're lazy, George, because it took me like less than 10 minutes per situation you proposed, per issue you posed. And like, I'm not an expert in any of these fields. So you're either being lazy or... I don't know, maybe you don't understand what it is you're reading, but like the solutions to the majority of those problems are out there and easily accessible. Some of them are open questions, like the amount of volatile carbon on the moon. There are ideas, some people are proposing that the Theia impact event wasn't as intense as previously modeled, and like that model can work to explain the carbon present. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning, open questions are allowed in science. That's kind of the point of it, no? So you, you've seen how the secular camp have multiple heat problems that they ignore or hand wave away, but it's the creationists who have a heat problem. How, how amazing is that, eh? Yes, it is the creationists who have a heat problem. Every single one of those issues that you mentioned, even if all of them were currently not even a little bit solved, where scientists had absolutely no idea, none of them are preclusionary data that breaks physics. This is the most important part of the whole heat problem thing that you guys don't seem to be getting. The nature of the problem is that it cannot have a solution by its very nature. Let's look again at the issues that George posed, right? He talked about the inner core, which has a potential solution that's still in the works, but the current one seems to model well with all of our other variables. We have the fulgurites. That was nonsense. Fulgurites that are fossilized lightning are found all the time. And he talked about the Tapete Sandstone. That was also nonsense, as we showed that it's best explained by conventionally scientific processes because the flood cannot form the bends and cracks that are present in the Tapete Sandstone. We talked about the radioactive elements in the crust, as well as the granite, in another video. The Thea formation with the volatile carbon was an open question. That's the only truly open question listed here. The water comets were not problematic. He, he posed that the amount of energy they released in bombarding the planet was an issue, but it isn't. In fact, significantly less of a problem than just the top 10 impact events that in the Young Earth Creationist model have to happen in a single year of the flood since they're in the geologic column. The horizon problem had a solution he didn't know about. The magnetic field isn't an issue in the conventionally scientific worldview, nor do creationists consider an issue because they just invoke that it flip-flops rapidly during the flood. So like, which of these is even remotely equivalent to the heat problem? A physics-breaking, world-vaporizing issue that makes Young Earth Creationism impossible, hmm? Riddle me that. So I guess they start to tire themselves out and transition into the sort of wrap up final challenges. Donnie brings up the fission tracks and the radio halos, which again, we already covered. Um, and then he wants George to kind of re-explain the cold slab situation. So we'll let him do that. Uh, but first he has this to say. You re reiterate for anybody just joining us because I don't want the guts of Gibbons of the world to do credit where credit is due. Erica did do a, a, a pretty uh, good job editing her latest video. Um, you know, gave me a couple of good laughs. I'm pretty easy going, so I'm not bothered by uh, little jabs, right? They kind of crack me up, actually. She likes to call me Donnie Deals, and, 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 and you know, that, that kind of makes me smile. I don't mind it. Very wholesome, Donnie. I'm okay with that. I think this would mean more to me if it weren't in the context of your normally erratic behavior. Like, yeah, that's a really nice thing for you to say now. What horribly mean thing will you say to someone tomorrow? or on an evening where you're pissed off and, and want to rage at the internet ether. If they, re if they read that, they'll find out that there's a number of um, 
assumptions, speculation and conjecture that goes along with that. And notwithstanding all that, Donnie, they, they actually modelled uh, up to 100 kilometres depth. And as I said earlier, these, sub, these subduction um, cold slabs that we spoke about are eight, sorry, 700 kilometres down into the, uh, into the mantle. So um, in short, that's pretty much it. But So like he hasn't really said anything different since the first time in this video that he brought it up. But to remind everybody out there, geology doesn't have an issue with cold slabs and they simply use the thermal diffusivity of rock in a set of pretty standard equations to get an estimate of how long it should take for these things to reach equilibrium with the surrounding mantle. Uh, and what we see is in line with that, as expected. So, whew, that's it. That's the end of the video. They say their goodbyes and, you know, scatter off to go do whatever it is that Bond and Donnie do during the day. The horror. Now, like, this has been a pretty exhausting video for me, as have the previous three videos that kind of covered the same general topics to this one. But I felt, as I said at the beginning, that, that this was worth making to really square away what the issue here is. And just to really underline it and make it easy for everybody to understand, the heat problem is a preclusion to younger creationism, as is the radiation problem. At present, according to Donnie and Bond and McQueen here, they don't have a solution and neither do any of the pros. So for this reason, I think it's safe to say that the idea of young earth creationism right now as it stands is presently impossible. Anyways, you guys, I think hopefully this is going to be the last video on these guys for a while. I don't really suspect they're going to have anything to say in response other than like, hey, we're working on it and, and real science has problems that they're working on too. An insufficient response. Again, there's a difference between preclusionary problems and like open questions. Um, but it's going to be nice to have a little break. I've got some cool ideas in the works for sort of after the holidays. Uh, and I'm really ready to really go nose to the grindstone on all of that. My, my semester is going to be quite a bit easier next uh, next go around. So I'm, I'm excited. My class load is lower and really I'm going to be focusing on squaring away my sort of hypotheses for my dissertation uh, in the channel. So look forward to it. And so my gentle and of course very modern apes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you like what I do here and want to support me in other ways, you can do so at my Patreon, which can be found in the description. Anything counts and all of it helps. So thank you very much, you guys. And I hope that you do take care of yourselves.